Good morning, everyone. Good to be with you. We're in Luke, the 24th chapter, beginning in verse 13, and deal with the message, a lesson on Christ's victory over death and the grave. And the past, as now, that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together, they were discussing everything that had taken And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked this dispute that you're having with each other as you're walking. And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. The one named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? What things? He asked them. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet powerful in action and speech before God and in all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. But we were hoping he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. He said to them, how foolish you are and slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and the prophets, He interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. They came near the village where they were going, and he gave the impression that he was going further. But they urged him, stay with us, because it was almost evening, and now the day almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table with them, that he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. And they said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven And those with them gathered together who said, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. A lesson on Christ's victory on death and the grave, uh, over death and the grave. I wanted to add a closing bookmark to the Holy Week sermon series we began last Sunday. It is noteworthy that the good por- that a good portion of all the Gospels had their focus on these crucial few days at the end of the Lord's earthly ministry. <clears throat> and that was especially the case for the fourth Gospel. Chapter 11, which we covered last Sunday in the raising of Lazarus, covered, uh, continued this focus all the way to the end of the book in chapter 21. We are treated herein to extremely important messages Jesus delivered to his disciples in those final days. Where we left off last week was the very public raising of Lazarus that upset the apple cart, so to speak. Yes, a great many people saw the miraculous take place, and it brought a large number of them to faith in Christ as well. Others who had witnessed this spectacle, the same one, had the opposite reaction as they scurried off to tell the Pharisees, the Lord's enemies, of what he had done. Everything was stirred up which resulted in even Lazarus being put on a hit list. His very presence was a powerful testimony to the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. 
since you since just seeing him alive was enough to draw people to the Savior, the religious leaders of Israel decided that both Jesus and Lazarus needed to be eliminated. Let's begin this morning's message by first seeing two disciples that did a good job setting the stage about what had happened. The Gospels present a variety of settings where the Lord chose to reveal himself as the risen Savior. They began at the empty tomb and went from there. Luke, the historian who resulted, who researched the details of the stories he shared, brought us this fascinating window into the events of Resurrection Sunday. By speaking of Jesus taking a stroll on the road, headed to Emmaus and joining with two of the large disciples who were going home that way. First thing we noticed was that they, they were prevented from recognizing him. In spite of the fact that they were his disciples, many of these sightings of the risen Savior speak of those who saw the Lord alive from the grave, but didn't identify who he was, at least not at the first. One example was Mary Magdalene at the tomb. John's gospel recorded that she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. For her, it was hearing the Lord call her by name that made her know this was her Savior who was alive. I believe in the case, in the case of our passage, it was intended that these two not recognize him at first. In this way, the impact on them when they finally were allowed to know that it was him, was intensified. This happened when Jesus sat down at their table and joined them in a meal. The particular catalyst for their blindness to be lifted was this blessing and breaking of the bread when he said their eyes were open and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. It is interesting that we're only given the name of one of these two men, Cleopas, as Jesus encountered them, they had been in an intense discussion with each other, and the Lord asked them about it by using a Greek word that means they were throwing their words. The Christian Standard Bible called what they were doing a dispute. Obviously, their topic of conversation was something they were very animated about. Even the look on their faces when they turned to answer Jesus showed how serious they were. It was described variously as downcast sad, or discouraged. Cleopas answered the Lord's question by expressing surprise that he, or for anyone, for, or anyone else for that matter, didn't know what had recently happened there. What was it all about? They told him it was about Jesus of Nazareth, saying of him he was a prophet whose words and deeds were powerful before both God and all the people. They went on that it was this man who the chief priests and leaders delivered up to be executed by crucifixion, which they did. In other words, he died. That was a sad story. But what's the big deal about this tragedy? They explained for, further, but we were hoping he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Notice their words were in the past tense. We were hoping. There was no question in their minds Jesus was dead, and in spite of their aspirations about what or who he was intended to be, he was dead. He was in the grave. That's what the last thing they knew. That wasn't the end of the discussion, however. This, they told Jesus, was the third day since his death and burial. They added that some of their ladies that very morning had gone to the temple or gone to the tomb and found it empty. That was strange enough, but they also saw angels there who announced to them the news that Jesus was alive. The conclusion of what they told him was that some of the men who we knew know were fellow disciples of Jesus went to the tomb upon hearing this and investigated it further. They discovered that it was empty, just as the women had said. The more important point, however, which conveyed that they were still clueless was, but they didn't see him, meaning Jesus. What an incredible way these two, unbeknownst to themselves, had set things up for Jesus, the risen Lord, to hit it out of the ballpark, so to speak. We'll see the, that next. But before we do, Russell Moore was the former president of the 
Ethics and Christian Liberty, Ethics, Religious Liberty Commission, the Southern Baptist Convention. And back in, in 2017, he wrote a blog entitled Independence Day and in the Empty Tomb. In his article, he remembered the day he visited the grave of Thomas Jefferson. He then gave a few fascinating insights that he shared comparing that grave with the empty tomb of Jesus. I liked that the final paragraph of his post, he summarized, uh, was this, that the empty tomb is itself a declaration of independence. By raising Jesus from the dead, God declared him and all who were in him to be free from death, free from the curse, free from Satan's accusation. I suppose you could say Jesus was endowed by the Father with certain unalienable rights among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, except that these blessings don't end in a graveyard. Join me next in seeing in a second that Jesus, their teacher, gave them a lecture about everything that happened. Imagine being enrolled in the greatest seminary class ever that was being taught by the foremost expert on this subject. These men didn't know the priceless gift that they were receiving. <clears throat> the lesson began with Jesus getting their attention by calling them <clears throat> foolish and slow of heart to believe. <clears throat> what did he say they had been dense about? It was their acceptance of what the prophets had said was going to happen in the Messiah. In truth, this was what Jesus had warned them about prior to his passion and death. It was further what the angels reminded the women that Jesus had told them, which they then did recall. <clears throat> I feel it's important to mention that the Lord was disturbed by his disciples' hesitance to believe the women who first told them of Jesus' resurrection, and then also the others who confirmed this truth. Back at the beginning of the chapter, it described their reaction to hearing the women's testimony. But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. Mark's gospel even include the testimony of these two men that we're looking at today, who reported to their fellow disciples after they recognized their teacher was the risen Lord Jesus. Mark said in that exchange that they didn't believe them either. <clears throat> Their unbelief was not commended or commendable, but it served to strengthen the case for the, for the resurrection. Rather than accepting this reality easily, the evidence for resurrection in pamphlet stated all of Jesus' followers doubted the resurrection until Jesus physically appeared to them. Then they believed. It took them seeing him before they knew it was true. And the angels pointed out that he had told them this while he was still in Galilee, and that his message was of the was of the necessity that he, the Son of Man, be first betrayed, second crucified, and third to rise to life on the third day. Let the idea sink in. It was required that these awful things happen before he would win the victory once and for good. That was the gist of what he was teaching them, which he summed up by describing it as him suffering and then, only then, him being glorified. Suffering and then glory. The bare bones outline of his lesson plan that day <clears throat> was the beginning, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in the scriptures. The expanded version of this message Jesus later delivered to the disciples, including these two men. These are my words, Jesus said, that I spoke with you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. I can't possibly provide you anything close to the fantastic message they received that day. I can say that I agree with the Bible reference the Christian Standard Bible lists regarding the words of the Mosaic law that gave uh, the law which uh, were fulfilled in Christ's death on the cross. It was Numbers 21.9 that says, So Moses made a bronze snake and mounted it on a pole. Whenever someone was bitten and he looked at the bronze snake, he recovered. That's a no-brainer one. 
as John 3, 14 and 15 had Jesus himself share that just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. What a powerful way to introduce the glorious John 3, 16 promise. It's also not hard to imagine that one of the references to the prophet's message Jesus likely shared was with them was Isaiah 52, 13, all the way through the 53rd chapter. We may call this the suffering servant passage. And it reads as if it was a real-time reporting of what Jesus actually endured in his suffering, death, and even also his resurrection. Could there be any more precious statement made than when Isaiah looked down through the centuries and explained Christ's agonizing death on the cross with these words? But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned our on our own way, turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. The come, then coming back to life, the coming back to life part was also predicted when Isaiah gave God's word on the subject by saying, See, my servant will be successful. He will be raised and lifted up and greatly exalted. And then again, it says about Jesus, he will see his seed, he will prolong his days, and by his hand, the large pleasure will be accomplished. Two quick verses from the Psalms, which came to come to mind and might very well have been highlighted by the Lord as he taught them. Psalm 41, 9, I think, looked ahead to Judas Iscariot's part that he played in this unfolding tragedy. The Psalmist said, from the betrayed Messiah's viewpoint, even my friend, whom I trust, one who ate my bread, has raised his heel against me. Psalm 69, 21 envisioned when the Messiah would hang on the cross, and it said, instead, they gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. And aside about the time on the cross that Jesus acknowledged that he thirsts, has John 19, 29 say they put a sponge on a branch full of a sponge full of sour wine on a branch and held it up to his mouth. Then verse 30 explained when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up the spirit, his spirit. I'm convinced the Lord did that in order for him to clear his parched mouth so his voice could be heard to say the Greek word tetelestai meaning it is finished. He was announcing loud and clear that his death, that in his death, the victory was won. And that's a hallelujah. I, I can't imagine the awesome privilege these two men had to hear this stranger reveal to them such incredible truth. Even so, the best part of this day was still to come. That moment came when the stranger who walked beside them, was offered their hospitality as they came to their home. I've already shared that upon reclining by the tra table, Jesus gave thanks and then broke the bread and distributed it to his hosts. In that instance, their eyes were open, and they saw that this one who was the guest in their home was none other than Jesus, alive and well. That, I think, was the best experience they ever had. After he vanished, they said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scripture to us? Every child of God, I believe, has had this wondrous experience. We've heard God speak to us via his word, and our hearts were literally stirred with excitement within us. How do I know they were so elated about their experience? It was late in the afternoon or early evening. Even so, they couldn't keep this wonderful news to themselves, and they got back on the road headed to Jerusalem in order to share what had happened, and they found when they got there, they weren't the only ones to be blessed by a visit from the risen Lord Jesus that day. Simon Peter also had had that privilege. Yet their stupendous Sunday wasn't over yet. <clears throat> As they, according to John's telling of it, 
<clears throat> were inside a room that was had locked doors because they were afraid of, Je of the Jews. And that group then was blessed to have Jesus, the risen Savior, join them there. It was locked, and he didn't have a key, but he came anyway. He was in there anyway. How incredible. I've got to say that it was seeing Jesus alive from the grave that transformed once cowardly men and made them exceptionally courageous witnesses. As I was reminded by a program I heard on the radio this week that Every one of the apostles besides John died as mortars, and none of them backed away from the confidence they had in their living, glorified Savior. Was this just an interesting story they were telling? Not, all, not at all. Not on your life. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we've observed, what we touched with our hands concerning the word of life. What had they heard, seen, observed, and touched? It was Jesus, alive from the grave. That's what. Oh, that's who. Both of these quotes were by the late Billy Graham. In the first one, he urged, never forget that the resurrection of Christ is in many ways the end of all history. If you think about the important things that happen in this world, this is it. This is the most important, both the cross and the resurrection. His second was a poem of sorts, and it seems appropriate in light of the fact of today's sunrise service out at the park. He wrote, the resurrection of Christ changed the midnight of bereavement into a sunrise of reunion. It changed the midnight of disappointment into a sunrise of joy. It changed the midnight of fear into a sunrise of peace. I enjoyed hearing a sermon this week by the late preacher Adrian Rogers about the resurrection of Jesus. And he said a teacher gave an assignment to write an essay on the greatest living man. And one student wrote it on Jesus Christ. The teacher said, this is a wonderful essay, but you misunderstood. I said the greatest living man. That student rightly answered that teacher, he is alive. <laughs> Let me say in closing, that's the greatest news imaginable. Those of us who know him in repentance and by faith have been rescued, blessed through and through, and quickened, which has the meaning of have been given new life. What we can say is that Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Do you know him? It's a wonderful Resurrection Sunday morning, and we rejoice together. We have so much to be thankful for. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, in the name of Jesus, we rejoice in this privilege. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the promise that you've, you've given, that, that uh, you came for us, that you took our place and died, and that in you we live, we'll have eternal life and live forevermore. Father, I ask you for those who are watching this or will watch it, I, I ask you, Lord, for your blessings upon uh, the gathering in our worship service in just a few minutes and your blessings upon these words, this message, your truth. We love you and trust you, Lord, and thank you for your great grace extended our way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us. Have a great Resurrection Sunday.